Hello and welcome to another edition of our Davies Vodcasts, uh, the owner frequently asked questions. Uh, this is a series where we um, go through uh, common questions that owners ask us about a specific condition once a diagnosis is made. My name's Ian Battersby and I'm head of internal medicine at Davies and today we're going to be talking about a condition called immune mediated thrombocytopenia also known as ITP which is a little bit briefer. Um, now this is a condition commonly sit well seen by the medicine department so I'm joined by Anna Threlfall who's a member of our internal medicine team and what we'll do is we'll just overview a little bit about what this condition is and then talk about some of the questions that we always get from owners when we make this diagnosis so hopefully it can reassure you give you an idea of how these cases pro uh, progress so um first of all welcome Anna um, hello good morning hello and um well firstly so we start with well so we call it ITP rather than immune mediated thrombocytopenia yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful a bit of a mouthful so um what is ITP um in your, so, your as, as you said the so ITP is immune mediated thrombocytopenia so um I think the first thing to um, um, talk about is what is thrombocytopenia. Um, so thrombocytopenia simply means a low number of platelets. Um, platelets are a small um, type of um, kind of blood cell, which are, is really um, involved in blood clotting. So if you don't have enough blood clotting cells, if you don't have enough platelets, um, then you, this will lead to problems with blood clotting, which is obviously essential um, in day-to-day -day life um, and then the immune mediated form of this low level of platelets is where the immune system destroys the body's own platelets so it's an autoimmune condition um, if we compare it to conditions in humans people can get rheumatoid arthritis where the the immune system um, like destroys the joints whereas in this condition it's where the immune system is destroying the platelets in the body um, and causes problems then with blood clotting. Okay, so so yeah, in summary, you know, we the, the 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 clotting system's quite complicated. There's lots of different components, and all all got their own different level, degrees of well, they're all important. And this is one component that the immune system gets a bit confused, starts destroying it, um, and then when you haven't got those, you're obviously at risk of bleeding. And so, what what causes the immune system to do that? Well, in a lot of cases, we don't know. Um, so there's two, broadly speaking, there's two different types of immune mediated thrombocytopenia, so ITP. Yeah. Um, there's the type that is what we call idiopathic or primary. And this is okay. where there is not an identifiable primary cause for the immune system suddenly to suddenly do this. Mm -hmm. um, so it happens spontaneously um, mm -hmm. in that case. So that's primary ITP or idiopathic ITP. Mm -hmm. But in a number of cases, we can identify a primary trigger. Okay. And this could be exposure to a certain drug or um, there is some speculation about vaccination, but that is not proven. Mm -hmm. um, certain cancers can cause the immune system to do this. Mm -hmm. And basically um, also other types of infections, um, specifically some tick-borne infections can also do this. Mm -hmm. um, and basically... Um, these infections or cancer or drugs, toxins and so on, um, turn the immune system on in an abnormal way um, mm. such that the immune system turns on itself and starts to destroy the, the platelets. Okay, all right. And, and obviously not having any platelets, um, you know, it's, it's, it's potentially dangerous. I mean, how, how do these cases present um, so these cases present in a number of different ways, um, but the most common presentation is where owners notice blood spots on the skin um, or on the gums. Um, so the um, obviously, as we said before, platelets are responsible for blood clotting. So it's little signs of little bleeds. Um, so little bleeds on the gums, little bleeds on the skin, but also you can get blood in the feces. Um, that can be red blood or even black stools, which is digested blood in the stools. Mm -hmm. um, some patients might have some vomiting, which might contain blood or what we call coffee grounds. So that really kind of brown digested blood that can come up in the vomit. Some patients might have blood in the urine. Um, so there's a variety of different ways um, or places where patients patients can bleed um, yeah. and then um, present with bleeding. But actually some cases um, can present um, rather incidentally. So we do, um, so patients are just not quite right. Um, and then we do a blood test and we identify that they've got low numbers of platelets um, without these obvious clinical signs of bleeding. Mm 
Okay. And so you mentioned little bleeds. Can Mm -hmm. those bleeds ever become life threatening? Yes, absolutely. So it very much depends on the location, because obviously if you have a little bleed on um, under the skin or a little bleed in the gum, then that's unlikely to be, if it's just a single or a few bleeds, then it's unlikely to become life-threatening. Yeah. But you can have bleeds in more life So even a relatively small bleed within the brain can be life threatening um, and a small bleed in the lungs can become life threatening because, of course, that can cause breathing difficulties. Um, And I've said small bleeds, but actually um, this can if you have a number of small bleeds, this becomes a large bleed. Um, And in some cases, patients can also become anemic. And that means um, a loss of red blood cells. Patients are bleeding or lose red blood cells. And if you lose a large quantity, then obviously anemia can also become life threatening in some cases as well. So, yes, absolutely. It can become life threatening. So I I guess in in, as you say, I mean, we, we both see a variety of these cases. Some of them are very stable, picked up incidentally. And mm-hmm. then there's some that are more life threatening, um, potentially needing a blood transfusion. You know, mm-hmm. And that's where you're giving red blood cells. What about can we give animals a, a platelet transfusion in a similar way to blood transfusion? Well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? If you if you are lacking platelets, then yeah. obviously, well, um, we can potentially give patients platelets as a replacement, um, which can then potentially function. And that's something that is being um, looked into in quite some detail, but actually we don't have platelet transfusions available in veterinary medicine um, routinely at the moment. And for this particular condition, um, there have been there has been some work on this and and platelets that are transfused, so platelets that are um, administered to a patient that doesn't have very many platelets, those platelets are actually destroyed relatively rapidly and mm. will only be functional probably for around 24 hours. Um, so the value in giving platelet transfusions to this to these patients is relatively questionable. But at the same time, it's a it's an area of research at the moment. Um, yeah. So I'm not saying that in you know a few years time we won't have platelet transfusions available for patients with ITP. But as it stands, um, yeah. this is a research tool only. And we don't generally give platelet transfusions for these guys. Yeah. So I guess we, it'd be nice to have. But as you say, you know, some of these patients you know, need treatment for a long period of time. So giving them a transfusion of platelets that only last 24 hours you know, mm-hmm. you know, versus you know, some of the other treatments. And, I, you know, a lot of these, you know, if anything, these patients might need blood transfusions, I guess, where we're giving them ability to, to um, uh, transfer oxygen around the body yeah yeah absolutely and that kind of brings me on to another point actually um so when we when we typically give a blood transfusion that you're referring to we give red blood cells as you said and those red blood cells deliver oxygen around the body but we can in some cases deliver whole blood so this is where um you can deliver blood that contains some platelets so that would be a, a um, blood that's taken from a donor mm. not processed but given straight to a recipient within a six hour period. And Mm. those units will contain some platelets. And Mm. that small amount of platelets can be life saving in very rare cases. So we do very occasionally give a whole blood transfusion, which will contain a few platelets Mm. to try and save a dog's life. Um, But that's we do that um, in only very occasional cases. That's not something we do as a matter of routine in these in these patients, because those platelets, as we said before, are only functional for a very limited time period. But in rare cases, that can be enough time to save a patient's life. Yeah. Okay. so it's probably just just to give the listeners an idea of how we you know, if we have a case that presents and and what I probably say is if we talk about a fictional dog, because I mean, I don't know about you, I've I've seen occasional cats with ITP, but it's mainly dogs that we tend to see. It is mainly dogs, I agree, yeah. 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 Um, so if we have a dog that's presented, you know, let, let, I probably, let's say, uh, you know, not one of the more accidental ones, you know, a, a dog that's you know, got obvious bruising, bleeding in, in, in small number of sites, mm-hmm. not particularly life threatening. And it's arrived. You've admitted it. You know, what, you know, what are the different aspects of management that you put in place? 
So I guess the first thing to to work out is, uh, you know, is this patient in an immediately life threatening situation? Yeah. Um, and if that patient is, then we might need to do something um, aggressive to start with. And um, so, for example, um, if a patient is anemic, if they've had a large amount of blood loss, mm. those patients might benefit from a red blood cell transfusion that will improve their red blood cell numbers mm. um, and um, um sort of resolve their anemia but it doesn't resolve the the low number of platelets so then we need to think about investigating that but then at least you've stabilized the patient yeah. um so we then need to think about um once you've stabilized the patient initially we then need to think about investigating mm. um talked about um, that the, the condition we're talking about is immune mediated thrombocytopenia ITP but there's obviously other reasons why dogs can have a low level of platelets mm -hmm. um, so the first thing to actually work out is does this dog have immune mediated disease or does it have another reason for low levels of platelets um, so we do a series of blood tests to um, work that out basically um, mm. and then we would also need to do some diagnostic imaging to look for other reasons that dogs might have low levels of platelets um, but also look for underlying reasons that a dog might have immune mediated destruction so if you remember a little while ago we talked about um, dogs with secondary ITP and they're dogs that have an underlying infection or cancer or something like that leading to the ITP we then want to exclude that as well so once we've stabilized our patient we'll then do some further investigations which will include blood tests and then perhaps some chest x-rays to look for cancer or infections in the lungs and then we'll do an abdominal ultrasound scan um, to look for evidence of um, tumors and so on in the in the abdomen um, but also by doing these tests we'll also look for areas where we might see other bleeds so uh, we might see some bleeding in the lungs we might see some bleeding in other areas of the abdomen um, but when we do these tests we have to be very very cautious because obviously um, these patients bleed spontaneously mm -hmm. so when you're doing an ultrasound scan you can actually cause some bleeding so really careful patient handling is really very important and actually sometimes we do um, a CT scan for example rather than an ultrasound scan because we don't have to handle the patients in the same way but that's very case dependent and clinician dependent as to how we go about evaluating them for underlying disease. Yeah. And yeah there's, there's those really challenging cases where you see something on the imaging and you'd like to sample it but because they have no platelets you can't sample it um, which are uh, uh, tricky to manage um, and what about travel history are there any uh, you know are there any conditions that you need to screen for you know in low that, that might be relevant um, yeah that's on? a really good point um so there's a number of infectious diseases that can lead to a low number of platelets either um, through other mechanisms or through an immune mediated mechanism as well mm. um, so we we have to look for those diseases or at least question the owners about the history of the patient so mm. if you have a you know a pocket poodle that's never been out of the UK and um, doesn't really scavenge anything, then I wouldn't be too worried about looking for infectious diseases in those dogs. But if you have a dog that had a travel history to France or something, for example, um, there are infections we need to look for. Specifically, um, Babesia um, is one that's been mentioned in, in, a, in another podcast. Um, but other diseases, for example, Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, um, can also cause um, low levels of platelets, which are um, diseases that are typical for dogs that have travelled abroad, but we can see these in the UK in mm. non-travelled dogs now. Um, mm. So we might want to test for those in non-travelled patients as well. Mm. And I think I think the key is that you know with with all these cases is if that we need to ex exclude all those conditions before we treat ITP because you know essentially only treating the underlying trigger is the best way to manage it but also you might make some of those conditions worse with the treatment that we're going to talk about now. Um, Absolutely yes so it's really important to rule them out. Yeah so I've, a, a seamless link there um, <laughs> <laughs> we've 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 done all our screening we've done all our blood tests and mm -hmm. you know this is a pri this is a, a dog with a primary um, uh, immune mediated thrombocytopenia or ITP so there's no mm -hmm. trigger that we can find. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to stop the immune system from destroying the, the, the platelets? Okay, so I think, um, <coughs> a bit of a cough, sorry. Okay. Um, so um, with regard to treatment, um, as you um, alluded to a second ago, um, 
it all go, comes back to we need to rule out those other conditions first. And if we identify another condition, for example, an infection or cancer, mm. we need to try and focus on treating those. So treat the underlying disease um, first um, before you go on to, to considering treating sort of an immune mediated component. But in those cases where you haven't got an immune mediated, sorry, if you haven't got another underlying disease, then indeed we need to suppress the immune system. Um, so we do that um, by using immunosuppressive medication. So we use um, predominantly steroids. Mm -hmm. um, so steroids will suppress the immune system and halt this destruction of platelets. And um, they're our kind of go to drug. Um, but of course, they don't work in every single case. Mm -hmm. um, but if they are going to work, they will typically work within about three to five days, sometimes shorter, sometimes um, at, at these immunosuppressive doses, absolutely. Okay. And so if is there anything, I mean, there's medications that can be used alongside steroids, particularly there's a chemotherapy agent. Do you want to overview? Yeah. Yes, that's, um, that, so we, so that's generally used first line. Now going back to kind of the emergency treatment that we discussed at the, um, at the beginning. Um, mm. So there is a drug called vincristine, which mm. is a, typically used for um, animals with cancer okay, and humans with cancer as well. But actually this drug leads to the um, sort of increased release of platelets from the bone marrow. So platelets mm -hmm. are produced in the bone marrow on cells called megakaryocytes mm -hmm. um, and then released into the circulation where they can be functional. And using this drug called vincristine in increases the release of platelets from the bone marrow. But in addition to that, there's probably other mechanisms as well um, that actually um, suppress the immune system a little bit um, and lead to an increased level of platelets in the circulation. But we tend to use this as a, an emergency drug. We don't mm -hmm. use this as a long term agent. Um, so it's in those initial phases where you are uh, waiting for your prednisolone, which is your standard long term treatment, waiting for that drug to work over that three to five day period we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, we can use vincristine in the short short term to enhance the level of platelets really very quickly in one or two days um, yeah. hopefully Hope, hopefully yeah yeah because and um well you've mentioned steroids and you know both as medicine clinicians we use a lot of steroids so um we do know that they can be very beneficial but they also come with side effects so you know what what are the potential side effects that these you know these patients might have particularly the dosages that we use in itp cases yeah, so when we are trying to suppress the immune system down with steroids, we do need to use very high doses. Yeah. Um, and um, because of these high doses, we do see side effects in the large majority of our patients. Mm. And those side effects are typically relatively benign and, and not something that we need to um, worry about. They're not generally life threatening side effects or anything like that. But it is something that we do need to take into account. So mm. most commonly um, in dogs, we see excessive thirst and excessive urination, um, mm. which Sounds very benign, but if you've got a dog that's urinating all over the house all the time, that can become distressing for both the owners and the dog. So that's something we do need to really think about. Um, so excessive thirst and excessive urination. Um, and together with that, um, we do see excessive appetite. Um, and um, But it's really important to realise with that aspect of things, even though dogs are very hungry, they don't actually require additional food. And mm. if you feed them more, they will gain weight. Um, mm. So it's a really um, difficult balance when you've got a dog that's begging you for food. It's really important not to feed them excessively, otherwise they will become overweight. Mm. Um, so excessive appetite. Um, we talked a moment ago about excessive thirst. Now, with excessive thirst, you must not restrict water intake. So water mm. intake should be allowed um, and in, in the majority of cases, whereas with the with the food, you can actually restrict that. So mm. increased thirst, increased urination, increased appetite are very common. Mm. Um, we also see um, in some dogs, they can have behavioral changes. They can become more lethargic um, and so on. And um, that can be quite upsetting and um, can, we can we need to reduce the dose in those dogs because they clearly don't feel very well. Mm. Um, so lethargy. And then um, although we talked briefly about weight gain just then um, with uh, with the increased appetite, a number of dogs, particularly um, larger breed dogs, for example, Labradors and the like, um, can lose quite a significant muscle mass um, mm. to get muscle wastage. And that can be on their legs or on their head. Um, and that can lead to weakness and lethargy as well. Um, mm. So those are the 
those are the side effects which are not considered I guess life-threatening but can have quite an impact on patient quality of life and um, mm -hmm. so we do need to to think about them okay. um but then that then there are more significant side effects that we can see with steroids as well so on high doses steroids can lead to um ulceration of the gastrointestinal tract so, and right. that can cause vomiting and diarrhea um, and specifically you can get um, sort of blood in the vomit and diarrhea which overlaps with the clinical signs of this condition of course but um, in those cases we would you know that can become um, very worrisome that can become life-threatening so if you have a patient that is on steroids and they start to have vomiting or diarrhea or they start to have some feces with a black color to the feces it's really important that you contact your local vets or um, your the clinician urgently because the steroids will need to be yeah uh, weaned and, and, and adjusted Absolutely, and and I get I guess yeah. Yeah. I, I guess on that you know these patients you know it's not a short trip on steroids they they can require steroids for a number of months, and if and you know there may be patients that you know are having a really difficult time um, on the on the steroids or may not even be responding to the steroids so we have to add in second agents. Do you want to maybe just overview you know maybe if we just talk about the scenario you've got a dog that's drinking you know litres and litres and litres all day and just can't stop urinating how, how would we manage that okay so um if you have a patient that has i think there's there's, there's two questions there really so yeah. we start dogs on very high doses of steroids um so there's a there's a situation where um they're on high doses of steroids that they are tolerating them well but actually the the platelet numbers are not recovering they're not improving mm -hmm. well enough um, so we need to think, OK, well, we've, we've maxed out our steroids. We can't go higher with these patients not getting better. What do we do in that circumstance? And then we have the situation that you've just um, alluded to where actually you've got a patient that's actually doing quite well in the sense that their platelet count has recovered, but they have very significant steroid related side effects. So there's two groups of dogs there where this is relevant to. Yep. And in that circumstance, we might then consider actually additional immunosuppressive medication um, and that will allow us to um, in um, it will allow us to wean the dose of steroids down in those st stable patients but hopefully add to the immunosuppressive management when you haven't got enough platelets um, so probably should have separated these two groups of dogs out sorry. that's my <laughs> um, poor question um, so <laughs> that, um, so we're talking about second agents here. So these are um, other immunosuppressive medications which can assist the steroids. Um, and certain drugs um, that we think about are cyclosporin, and that's an, a licensed um, immunosuppressive drug that we could use. Um, there's one called leflunamide, um, one called mycophenolate, one called azathioprine. So there's a large number of um, other immunosuppressive medications. And the choice of the second medication um, is is very much dependent on the individual case, what drugs they might be able to tolerate. Um, and it's also partly clinician dependent. Unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of evidence in the veterinary literature to support which, which second agent is, is the best, if you like. We know that steroids is the most reliable immunosuppressive drug that we have available to us, but we don't know what's the second best. Um, so as I say, this is patient dependent and clinician dependent as to which drug we choose. Um, and then, of course, it's a case of, of monitoring your patient long term. Are they responding to the medication? Do they have side, effect, side effects of the medication and so on? And then we can tweak the medication accordingly. Yeah. So just to just to summarise my my poor question, <laughs> I mixed two scenarios. Um, so we use steroids primarily, um, but then we might have some patients that don't respond to the steroids. So then we add in a second agent. But then we have some patients that may respond to steroids, but the side effects are so bad that we need to try and reduce the steroids. So we add in a second agent so we can reduce the steroid medication. OK, that sounds about um, I, sh I should have really asked it like that <laughs> initially. Um, so here's the most challenging question that I often find is how long does a patient need to be on the medication for? Well, um, that's a difficult <laughs> question to answer. So um, with dogs with um, ITP, they need to be on medication for a very long period of time. It's not like a dog that gets, you know, an infection. You treat it with a seven day course of antibiotics and that infection gets better. Um, when you have an immune mediated disease such as ITP, um, the medication needs to be continued for a long period of time. So what we tend to do is start on high doses of steroids plus or minus another medication and we assess response. 
If they are responding and they are stable, we can then gradually wean those medications down. Um, and that, again, is, is partly clinician dependent and patient dependent. So gradually wean them down. And that weaning process can take anywhere um, between, uh, we generally aim for a four to six months um, weaning period for steroids. Mm -hmm. um, but in that weaning, we every time we wean the dose down, we have to make sure that the platelet level is not dropping, um, which is called, if the platelet level starts dropping again, that's called a relapse, mm. um, at which point we wouldn't want to reduce the dose um, any further. Um, and it, as I say, it's patient dependent. So some patients can go the six month weaning period, they can come off steroids, and they can be off steroids for the rest of their life and never have a relapse event. Mm -hmm. um, there are patients that you um, go through the six months, you manage to get them off, but months after stopping medication, they actually relapse. And those patients do then require long term, potentially even lifelong medication. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a subset of patients that you start on the medication, you start weaning them down, but you can never actually wean them down to zero because every time you get them down on a low dose, dose they, yeah. they relapse. Um, yeah. So it's a little bit of a, a difficult question to answer. It's very patient dependent, but essentially the minimum period that a patient will be on medication for is about six months. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the ultimate how long's a piece of string, isn't it? Because yes, yeah. it's so variable, yeah. so variable. I mean, what about if you do get a patient off all medication? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there are concerns about vaccination and things like that. Um, is there anything else that, you know, that owners should avoid that might cause a relapse? So um, I guess if um, if you've identified a primary trigger mm. for the ITP, for example, if a patient has developed um, this disease secondary to some recent drug administration, mm. um, you wouldn't want to obviously give that drug again in the future because there is a potential that you'll see the same situation again. Um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to identify what those drugs are drug exposures might be, mm. um, but that's really important. Um, you mentioned vaccination, and, and that's, a, again, a, a bit of a controversial question mm. um, because um, some people um, suggest that there is a potential link between vaccination and immune-mediated disease, whether, uh, whereas other um, papers do not um, agree with, with that link. Mm. Um, but ultimately, um, vaccination is a... Um, um, it's not a procedure really, but by vaccinating a patient, you stimulate their immune system. Mm. Um, so if you are going to do that, there is a potential higher risk of mm. um, developing an, another immune mediated disease in the future. As I say, it's a potential higher risk. We really don't know. We cannot quantify that risk. But yeah. what I generally say um, is that if you have um, a patient that has been previously vaccinated um, for the core vaccines, um, so parvo, distemper and so on, um, you can actually do um, antibody titer tests. Mm. Um, so these are blood tests where the antibody levels are measured. Mm. If the antibody um, titer is adequate, um, that will suggest a really good immunity against those particular conditions and therefore vaccination is not required mm. um, for those specific conditions. So um, specifically parvovirus, um, distemper mm. and canine hepatitis, you can actually do those tight tests for. Mm. Um, there is one disease called leptospirosis where that antibody titer is actually not very reliable. It doesn't tell you um, whether you've got an adequate um, immunity, adequate protection. Mm. So for dogs that um, um, have had ITP and are coming up to their vaccinations and they're due a leptospirosis vaccination, that's a much more difficult question to answer because you can't test whether they need the vaccination or not. Mm. Um, so then it's about looking at that patient and identifying whether they are at risk of leptospirosis. So mm. um, leptospirosis is a condition that's picked up from um, sort of um, is is associated with um, stagnant water, um, animal urine being in, in water, essentially. So dogs that drink dirty puddles or run around on farmland and drink puddles from farms or eat feces when they're out and about or um, lick or drink from animal water buckets or yeah. um, water sources, things like that. So your, your average Springer Spaniel, your Labradors that do all these sorts of things, in those dogs, they are actually a higher risk of leptospirosis. So I actually would recommend vaccinating them. Yeah. Um, but if you have a pocket poodle that never puts its feet on the ground, um, yeah. then in those dogs, they're at a very low risk of leptospirosis. And I perhaps wouldn't consider vaccinating them. So it's about a risk benefit 
um, analysis um, with regard to leptospirosis vaccination in mm. dogs that have had an immune-mediated disease. Cool, brilliant. Well, um, thank you very much again for a very comprehensive summary of, of, of this condition. I hope everybody who's listening has found that useful. Um, again, we, we, you know, we very much enjoy doing these. So if um, owners at home have listened to this, have got ideas of other topics, you know, um, certainly relating to medicine cases, but also, you know, other types of cases, be it orthopedic, cardiology, you know, soft tissue surgery, please let us know and we can see whether we can produce one. Um, finally, just want to thank Anna again for, for a great um, uh, little discussion there and uh, everybody at home, please stay safe.